And I'm very pleased that we have May Russell, who is Professor of um, uh, Government at the um, Constitution, uh, Constitution Unit at UCL, and Daniel Gover, who is um, co-author of the book, who uh, studied his PhD at Queen Mary, West, um, Queen Mary uh, University of London. And then to respond, we've got um, Baroness Hollis and um, David Nansler, uh, who's part of the House of Commons. Um, it's my great pleasure to start by asking Daniel if you'd like to... Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is, um, we're just gonna, Meg and I are just going to speak for um, a few minutes, just summarising the key uh, findings of the book. I'm going to try and get out of the way so you can see, hopefully you can all see the screen. Um, okay, in terms of what um, we're going to cover, um, I'm just going to start with the common assumptions about the Westminster legislative process. I'll then explain a little bit about the research that this book is based on. Um, after that, uh, I'll present some of our initial findings about amendments and their outcomes. Then after that, uh, Meg will take over uh, and expand uh, the view of, of what we're studying to look at um, defining influence more broadly than just amendments. And this will sort of end up with um, what we term six faces of parliamentary power. Okay, so in terms of um, common assumptions about the legislative process, this is really the context within which um, we studied this topic. Um, and in both uh, popular accounts and uh, among academics, there's often an assumption that the Westminster Parliament is relatively weak when it comes to government legislation. So, for instance, these quotes um, from uh, politicians and others. So, Chris Hume describes the Commons as a legislature on its knees. Uh, Ken MacDonald, writing in The Times, described the Commons as an elaborate rubber stamp. Um, and William Hay, when leader of the opposition, said that Parliament nods through complicated and important legislation with only cursory investigation. So, this is among popular accounts, but also Although it tends to be more nuanced, we, we tend to find similar things, similar assumptions uh, within academia. So here are just a couple of quotes from popular politics textbooks. Um, one says, it may be questioned whether Parliament effectively makes the law. And the other one says, the House of Commons is misunderstood if viewed as a legislator. So essentially, what we're trying to do in this, uh, in this research project um, was to look at whether this was true. Um, so in terms of the research, it was funded by the Nuffield Foundation, and our central question was that one, how influential is Parliament on government legislation? And then sort of spinning off from that, there are a number of other research questions that we cover in the book. The research was based around really in-depth uh, research into 12 case study government bills, um, we logged every amendment that was proposed to those bills, and there were um, over 4,000 in total. Um, and we read all the debates, and I haven't counted up how many words it was, but I suspect it was several million, I don't know. Um, and we also conducted around 120 interviews with key figures. So these um, were ministers, opposition, civil servants, outside groups, etc. And then in terms of the, the bills that we studied, here are the 12 um, case study bills. We chose seven from the 2005 to 10 Parliament, and we chose five from the 2010 to 12 session. Um, obviously, with just 12 bills, it's impossible to be fully representative. Um, but these were chosen to be as representative as possible of the different types of legislation um, that get considered by Parliament. Um, they ranged in size um, from about six pages to over 150 pages. Uh, they ranged in terms of the uh, government departments that were responsible. Uh, they varied in terms of the, the level of controversy uh, and uh, how high profile they were. So the first sort of layer of findings concerns the amendments that were proposed to these, um, to these bills. And in total, there were 4,361 amendments proposed. Um, and as I say, we've read them all, all 
There was a big difference between the outcomes of those sponsored by government and those sponsored by non-government parliamentarians. So for government amendments, around 95% were agreed to. And actually, if anything, this figure um, understates the extent to which government amendments were successful because that figure was really only dragged down by one bill where the government got into significant difficulty. By contrast, for non-government amendments, um, the success rate was about 4%. But again, if anything, that overstates uh, the success rate because um, there were 125 amendments agreed to, but 99 of those were overturned later in the process. So actually, the success rate in raw um, amendment success terms was, was even lower than that. Yet we know, and many of you in the room will know, that this is a simplification because actually government amendments frequently respond to earlier amendments by non-government parliamentarians. So to track this, we constructed what we call strands, and essentially strands are um, collections of amendments across different stages of the process. So an amendment may be proposed at Commons Committee, and then a similar amendment at Commons Report, and then Lords Committee, and then there may be a government concession at Lords Report. So essentially these are the, the number of distinct proposals that were made, and it allows us to track where government amendments came from, whether they were initiated by government or not. So there were about 2,000 strands in total across these bills, and 300 of these were successful. And in terms of where they came from, um, 165, so about 55%, were initiated by the government, and the remainder, 45%, were initiated by non-government parliamentarians. So we begin to see how what appears to be a government-dominated process actually, beneath the surface, responds a lot more to parliamentary pressure. And then if, if we strip out the strands that were solely technical, those figures are reversed, so that 55% of successful strands were initiated by non-government actors and 45% by government actors. So, um, Again, of, of substantial changes, a majority responded to non-government parliamentarians. And then finally, from me, in terms of where those, uh, who were the non-government parliamentarians? Beginning with the opposition, um, they initiated over one and a half thousand of the strands, and 112 of them were successful, which is a success rate of 7%. <coughs> Um, and here are just a couple of examples. So, on one of the bills, there was um, a high-profile issue to do with whether corporate manslaughter would cover deaths in custody, um, and that was initiated in part by the opposition in the Commons. For government backbenchers, the numbers are much smaller. So they initiated 304 strands. Um, and 36 of these were successful, but it's a higher success rate. And I should say, these figures um, include where they co-sponsored with other actors, so there is some overlap between these. And again, I've given a couple of examples there. So on the health bill under Labour, a proposal to increase the age at which people could buy tobacco was partly initiated by government backbenchers. And then non-party parliamentarians, so largely crossbenchers, but also independents and bishops. Um, much smaller numbers were initiated. Much smaller numbers of strands were initiated by them, um, and the success rate was well, eight percent. So between between the two, but much smaller numbers. In part, that reflects the fact that most of the non-party parliamentarians are in the House of Lords where most of the bills we studied uh, were introduced into the Commons. So it kind of makes sense that they, they, they didn't initiate these proposals. So just summarising this basic amendment level data, um, the opposition had a higher absolute success rate. So by far the largest proportion of successful strands came from non, uh, among non-government parliamentarians. 
came from opposition, but the success rate of government backed ventures was higher. And then finally, we found quite a significant difference between strands that had some form of cross-party support to them, whether at the start or in the middle of the strand, um, and those that didn't. So those that, were, those, those that had cross-party support um, had a success rate of 14% compared to 5% of those that were solely single party. So again, we begin to see that um, cross-party support is important in, in influence. I'm now going to hand over to Meg. Um, I wanted to start by um, actually saying some thanks to Lucinda for chairing to our two very distinguished respondents for responding. Uh, we wait uh, quaking to see what they're going to say. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it has to be said that what we're presenting to you now is very incomplete. It is a long book. It has many parts. Um, there are only things that we will not be able to cover, so this is very much just a sort of rather superficial overview of, of, of some of the key points. Daniel's given you the more quantitative um, results, and I want to talk a bit more about the, the more qualitative element. In a sense, this quantitative research was really important, and as Lucinda said, the biggest study of its kind for 40 years. But at the same time, it's really interesting and really important, but at the same time, it's maybe my job to say, actually, it's not, that, it's not that important. There are other things which are more important than the quantitative results to talk about the more sort of qualitative aspects. Starting with how we define legislative influence. So we've heard from the detractors of Parliament, even among the defenders of Parliament, it's quite common to hear people say that its influence on legislation is fairly limited. So take Philip Norton in his book, Parliament in British Politics. He comments that initiation and formulation of legislation is primarily overwhelmingly a government-centred activity. These kind of parliamentary defenders tend to put emphasis on Parliament's other functions as being its, its important contributions. Um, so the representative function, executive oversight, accountability, legitimation of policy making rather than actual policy making. But we ask in the book, to what extent can we really separate these things from the policy-making function? Just a brief diversion to give you Dan said what our central research question was, which is how influential is Parliament on government legislation? And we did all these interviews. And one of the things that we learned was that the closer you were to the inside of government, the more you seemed to think that Parliament was influential, which was quite, quite interesting. So, Here's a civil servant saying that Parliament is part of the climate of opinion which shapes how the legislation is framed in the first place. A former cabinet minister answering how influential is Parliament enormously. It's a widespread illusion that it isn't. Another civil servant saying it doesn't start and end with the bill itself. It's a constant dialogue with Parliament that is influential on what happens. And another civil servant saying Civil servants do, as do ministers, actually default to, there's a missing word there, default to Parliament as being the basis for everything we do. These are pretty strong statements from people, you'd think that people inside government would be dismissive of Parliament. The people at the heart of the machine say that Parliament is tremendously important. There are many more quotations uh, to back that up in the book. Um, what I want to do just very briefly is take you right to the conclusions of the book and introduce what we've referred to as the six faces of parliamentary power. And we borrow here from uh, the language which is used in the power literature in political science. Um, Stephen Lucas talks about faces of parliamentary power. Lots of other people have picked up that language and used it in different ways. The first face of power, we say, is visible change in Parliament through amendments. That's the obvious thing that you'd be looking for, and Dan has talked to you about that. But there are five other faces which are probably individually more important and collectively certainly more important than that first one. The second face, the, these first three are a little bit similar to what Luke says about the three faces of power, is anticipated reactions, the classic power of anticipated reactions, whereby the act, one actor waits to see what the other actor will do and tries to second guess how they're going to respond. So that second actor is having power in an indirect way. We've referred to this in other work as generating fear. Um, Parliament as a whole has this anticipated reactions power. Uh, the House of Commons and the House of Lords have it. 
particularly government backbenchers in the House of Commons have it, because they are the ultimate pivotal voters in Parliament. And here are some quotations about um, government backbenchers. So a senior Conservative saying, the Secretary of State's life is spent making sure that MPs from his own party, his or her own party, are supporting what he or she is intending. And if we can give you some examples, but actually, What's going on right now is pretty much an example of that. We've been hearing about these meetings with the whips on the withdrawal bill and the extent to which government is second guessing what Parliament is going to do. So maybe you don't need us to tell you that Parliament is actually pretty influential in the current climate. This is an interesting quotation from a Labour backbencher who spent many years on the backbenches and then went into work with number 10 and told us the amount of attention paid to what was happening in the Commons was quite staggering to me, who'd been in the Commons feeling I was completely impotent. So there's another example of when you get to the heart of the machine, you realize how much Parliament is listened to and paid attention to in terms of what proposals can be put. The, the book documents in detail, for the first time really, these processes inside government, the parliamentary so-called handling strategies, the extent to which government, civil servants and ministers think through in advance of introducing legislation, how Parliament's going to respond the kind of calculations that go on, the kind of negotiations and the kind of concessions, which Dan has already referred to in terms of amendments, uh, which government makes in order to avoid being defeated. Um, so, for example, on the Public Bodies Bill, that bill was very fundamentally changed in the House of Lords, but it was subject to only two or three defeats. Most of the big changes to that bill were government bringing forward very fundamental change to the bill because they knew that if they didn't, they would be defeated. Um, so that's one form of anticipated reactions. Um, but there are other anticipated reactions as well. There are the things which are not brought forward because ever brought forward because of the fear of how Parliament will respond. And one example, that we, these are very difficult things to find evidence for because this is measurable and as you go down the slide, it becomes less measurable. Um, but there was one clear example of something not being brought forward, which was that in the 2010 budget, George Osborne announced that there would be cuts to housing benefit for those who'd been on job seekers allowance for more than a year. This was absolutely expected to be in the government's welfare reform bill, uh, but the Liberal and Democrat backbench was furious about this. There were early day motions about it. There was an opposition day debate about it. There was a select committee report about it, condemning the government's proposals, and it never made it into the bill. That was virtually invisible if you look at the debates on the bill because it had already gone away beforehand. And um, that kind of leads into, this leads gradually into the third phase of power, which is the kind of least visible of all. This is calculated, whereas here, this is government not even thinking about putting things to parliament because it just instinctively knows it would be unacceptable. We've got a nice quotation from a member of the Office of Parliamentary Council in the book, saying, uh, who writes government legislation, the sponsoring department will have a sense of what it thinks it can ask Parliament, where it might need to concede, and what it shouldn't even ask for because it would be too unacceptable. This is partly, that's, even that is kind of calculated, but the nature of the nature of the legislature in parliamentary systems such as ours, can, in contrast to uh, presidential systems, where the government doesn't depend on the confidence of the legislature, is that conflict with the legislature in our system is very frightening. It's very dangerous. Governments can be brought down by defeats in the House of Commons. And they are very dependent on their own party. Ministers and backbenchers, of course, are drawn from the same party. Ministers know how backbenchers think. <coughs> there are some things they wouldn't even conceive of putting to Parliament because it would be too unacceptable. But this is utterly invisible, which is rather frustrating, and one of the reasons I think why people don't understand uh, Parliament very well. So that's the first three faces. Those can all be seen as uh, what people in the power literature refer to as power over. Um, but people in the power literature also point out that there are different kinds of power other than power over, kind of coercive power. There's also power to do things, positive power rather than negative power. One of the key things that Parliament does is decide what gets discussed. It's a public forum. There are enormous opportunities for parliamentarians to put things on the political agenda during the course of a bill, 
or in advance of a bill uh, being introduced. We refer to these as issue politicisation and agenda setting. Issue politicisation within a bill. What kind of things will get focus from the media and the public and parliament once a bill has been uh, introduced? And one of the interesting things about these faces, as I've already referred to, is that they can use mechanisms in parliament that are generally thought to be rather weak. One thing they can do, um, one thing that can be done is obviously put down amendments. And one of the reasons that the opposition puts down lots of amendments is because it wants to get things onto the agenda for discussion. It doesn't necessarily want those amendments agreed. Um, but also things like opposition days and, par and par uh, prime minister's questions, parliamentary questions, there's a whole series of, of high profile opportunities that opposition members and others have to get things onto the agenda. We have the example of a major change on the public bodies bill to remove the provisions um, which could have led to the privatisation of public forests, which was subject to an opposition day in the House of Commons, questions to the Prime Minister, and the government simply took those provisions out before the bill arrived in the Commons because it knew that it was in trouble. The House of Lords plays a very important issue politicisation function. Fear of the House of Lords is a very uh, major um, kind of dynamic in our system. But what the House of Lords does is it doesn't decide, it throws things back to the House of Commons to decide. So it decides what the House of Commons has to think about again. That's an issue for politicisation function. Select committees can put things on the agenda, as the Health Bill, as the Health Select Committee did uh, on the Health Bill with respect to wanting to strengthen the uh, provisions of the smoking ban. Agenda setting is a bit different. Agenda setting is putting things on the agenda in the first place that the government isn't even thinking about. And we've got examples in the book of proposals that were put onto the parliamentary agenda, particularly by government backbenchers, again using these kind of mechanisms like early day motions, private members' bills, and so on, um, repeatedly to call for the government to legislate on corporate manslaughter, which it really didn't want to do, repeatedly putting it onto the agenda uh, that there should be a smoking ban, which eventually there was. The fifth phase is what we call accountability and exposure. This is another part of Parliament's very public uh, arena function. Um, the government has to defend itself in Parliament on all of uh, the issues which are in front of Parliament. Um, going back to the point about there being so many amendments, it looked like there was some success with the amendments, but actually the vast majority of opposition amendments and backbench amendments failed. But an awful lot of amendments which are put are put there just in order to get the government to explain itself. Um, and if the government doesn't explain itself well, it will get into trouble. But the idea isn't that those amendments are necessarily going to be taken up. Uh, select committees, debates on the floor, parliamentary questions and so on, all require the government to explain itself and put the government on the defensive, which all leads to very careful preparation by government of what it puts to parliament in the first place. The sixth phase might seem a bit odd. It's support for the government. Because in an environment where uh, government backbenchers are relatively independent-minded, where the opposition certainly has no requirement to support the government, um, when Parliament supports government, we have to see it as an active choice. And there are cases in the book that you can point to. So, for example, well, I've mentioned the Liberal Democrats on the Welfare Reform Bill who oppose certain things, but the opposition were hoping, and Patricia might talk about this, they were hoping the that uh, the benefit cap, I was going to say, the opposition were hoping that the Liberal Democrats would, um, would block benefit cap. They wanted to, but in the end they decided not to. That was Parliament's decision, to back the government. On some things, Parliament is backing the government against pressure from outside. So on the smoking ban, the smoking in, the, the tobacco industry clearly didn't want that. Parliament decided to back the government. On corporate manslaughter legislation, there were lots of people in private industry who didn't want that. Parliament decided to back the government. That is a power of Parliament. So I'm coming to the end, and I haven't stuck to time in such a beautiful way as Daniel did. Our conclusions overall. As you can see, we believe that Parliament, we conclude that Parliament is very far from being a rubber stamp, as some people claim. Most substantive amendments agreed in Parliament, including those proposed by ministers, actually result from pressure from Parliament. It's not that government changes its legislation at whim, um, it's listening to Parliament. But measuring impact through amendments is far too simplistic. Bills are introduced in the first place after careful preparation to make them Parliament ready. 
Some bills themselves actually result from pressure from parliamentarians for government to legislate. There are multiple mechanisms inside parliament, not just the legislative process itself, which result in policy change through legislation. And there are multiple actors in parliament, in both chambers, backbenchers, um, putting things on the agenda, being the pivotal voters, the opposition, making a lot of noise about things, the House of Lords having the ability to throw things back to government. It's the combination of all of those actors that create the environment which government needs to negotiate its way through and help to generate fear of what parliament will do and ensure that government prepares really well. So contrary to the popular image, we say Westminster is not a rubber stamp, it is very much a legislator. Thank you very much, Beth. And I think it's it's absolutely fascinating. I've been reading this book whilst we've had this uh, the E withdrawal bill uh, slowly oh, gaining wow. its uh, pages and pages on the amendment paper, and I've been thinking very much about some of the things I've learned from reading your book and how it might play out with this bill. Um, and we're going to have a perspective now from the House of Lords and the former minister. Well, the, um, the first thing, if I may, is to actually congratulate Meg and um, Daniel. I think the book is admirable, I think it's elegant and important. And as a former historian by trade, I am amazed at the long, careful, fastidious attention to detail that both of you engaged in, and it made my head spin, so well, well, well done you. Um, I, what I'd like to, if I may, is make some general points, which Daniel may very well, um, or, or whoever, contest, and then go on, um, as Meg asked me to, to give some specific examples, when I was in opposition, then as a minister for eight years, then again as a backbencher in opposition, as opposed to a frontbench opposition, and the, the way the Parliament and Parliament's views, particularly in the Lords, really mattered to how we shaped it. Certainly when I had a bill and had to go to Legico, legislative committee, I was cross-examined in great detail as to the parliamentary handling strategy. I mean, absolutely right. Okay, so some general points first, and then some examples of, of where I have been experiencing in, or have felt the effect of our parliamentary pressure. Um, leaving aside Brexit for the moment, which sort of sucked the, sucked, sucked the oxygen out of most of the system, um, the first point I wanted to raise was SI, statutory instruments. We, up until this year at any rate, with Brexit and so on, what we've increasingly had, and to the fury of the laws, is skeleton bills, in which all the heavy lifting of policy detail was being carried by statutory instruments which were devised so you could have little technical changes like upgrading benefits without using primary legislation to do it. Instead, we were getting SIs where even the minister did not know what they would be used for, but was trying to take future, if you like, H, H, <coughs> Henry VIII powers as a sort of insurance against future secretaries of state who might or might not do X or Y or Z. And that role, therefore, um, is, is, is difficult because you see, statutory instruments, as you all know, cannot be amended. Uh, otherwise, they become sat primary legislation just like a bill. So each house, the Lords and the Commons, have identical and equal powers over SIs. You can either feebly regret, delete, and accept them, which we usually do, or fatally reject them, at which point it closes down the Commons vote, whatever the Commons vote becomes worthless, whether it's supported it or not. And that's happened half a dozen times in the Lords since the Second World War. And then usually it's accompanied by a major row. And what we need, is my, in my view, but I'd be delighted to hear uh, your views on this, is actually a pause button, a pause button, um, so that uh, for a couple of weeks you can ask the Commons to think again without going for the, um, the mutually sure destruction of voting down an SI or just a bleat which is ignored, sometimes with pieties, uh, because it's not, it's not fatal. And it was that space of trying to find a pause that was actually at the core of the tax credit stuff. Um, and I sought to occupy it, and the government accused me of creating a constitutional crisis um, until they decided we didn't. Um, my, my second worry, and my second concern, and I don't know whether this is backed by research or not, just a feel, um, in Social Security, which is the, I feel, um, almost everything costs 
money. Now, since I was in government, I get the sense that subsequent speakers have enlarged the claims of financial privilege. And what, I sh I'm again, I'm sure you know, what financial privilege means is if we in the Lords cross-bench amendment, because usually if you're a front bench, you try to get behind a cross-bench and get them to front it for you. Uh, so you make it easy for them to vote for it. But if you, if you win something in the Lords which has some financial implication, and it goes down to the Commons, because they started the bill, uh, the Commons can choose to say, uh, we claim financial privilege, uh, which for us is accepted, full stop. Whereas if, it doesn't, if they don't claim financial privilege, they are expected to send back a reasoned amendment to your amendment as to why they wouldn't accept what the Lords did. So the more the Commons claims financial privilege, the more you close down the effectiveness of scrutiny and ping pong in the Lords. And my sense is that it's growing, but I have no evidence, just, just, just a feel for it. Um, which brings me to my third point which is the difference between the very powerful, and I, I, I would welcome some sort of further enlargement on, between the very powerful common speaker, who determines the advice of the clerks, who determines financial privilege, selects amendments, keeps order. The Lord's speaker, I am pleased to say, is powerless. Uh, the House is self-regulating. So if you're having a debate, you'll go, you know, Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, cross benches, and, and so on, so what people give way to each other. The House of Lords is self regulating, it's therefore actually much more courteous, more courteous especially to women and disabled people, and people who are hesitant, and people who are finding their way. Um, if we engage in the Lords in Commons style tribalism, football teamery, and jeering, We'd send our swing boat, which is the cross benches, 120, 50, 150, we send the swing boat the other way. And because cross benches, by definition, decide the politics and <coughs> politics. Now, the final point, if I may, before going to some examples, is the difference between the role of Lords Ministers and Commons Ministers, before going to some case studies. Um, in the de in Department of Working Pensions, was DSS, now DWP, there might be, say, five ministers in the Commons, one Lords Minister. So a Commons Minister replicates on the floor of the House their departmental portfolio, very knowledgeable and very limited. So somebody doing pensions, the pensions minister would not, for example, stray to the housing benefit, that being for the housing, housing benefit minister. Uh, the Lords Minister, too, and like myself, we have a departmental responsibility, mine was family policy, but we have to cover, single minister, the entire waterfront of all the Commons ministers. So in DWP that led to pensions, not me, Malcolm Wicks, not John Dillon, disability, not me, somebody else, all benefits, tax credits, because Gordon uh, sent them from the Treasury to, to us to need to handle, bereavement, carers, guardians, transgender rights, housing benefit, low parent support, to universal credit. Everyone else's portfolio as well as your own, and you're expected to take their bill through and respond on your feet to the amendments that they come and the speeches that are made. Um, and of course, you do it without a majority. I usually have about 31% of the vote and had to negotiate to find the rest. So let me give some quick case studies of the interplay, all by slightly different routes, I think, between Parliament and the rest of the Westminster system as I've experience, and as I say, forgive these sort of personal examples. But firstly, in opposition, I, came, I joined the Lords in 1990 to do social security with the government. We had a transport bill, I think, in 1992. So I ran an amendment to permit local authorities outside London to regulate their minicab trade. So completely unregulated. A third of drivers had a criminal record. My side wanted a vote, I think so. But though I might have won it, if it didn't have government support, it would be overturned if the Commons, as, as Meg and I make clear. So two Tory grandees, Lord Helsham and Lord Boyd Carpenter, stood up and made little speeches urging me to withdraw my amendment so that the minister, Tory minister, could reflect. I took a punt to the pleasure of my side, I trusted them, and the minister, Robin Ferris, indeed came back with the government amendment to do exactly that. Thanks to persuading the Tory grandees of the quote-unquote wisdom of this approach. 
I could, if I tried to do it, I, I might well vote, but it wouldn't just stop down the other end. It would be a macho issue, and we, we, we just don't want to get into that territory if you can avoid it. A couple of years later, we were doing the 19, what became the 1995 Pensions Bill. This is following the Maxwell scandals. Now, pensions at the time were not matrimonial property, nothing to do with divorce. So their value could not be shared in any divorce settlement, even though the pension might be worth more than was worth more than the house. Women who had given up careers to where their children say could be left near destitute on divorce. The government would not budge. The hooray, Henrys, etc., etc., etc. But there is a strong sorority in the Lords. So the Tory Lady Okahoy and the former Tory Lady, Lady, Lady Janet Young and the Liberal Nancy Sears, we joined forces. Tory women peers told their whips they would not support the government, even though, of course, the government had huge numbers of hereditary peers behind them. I went after the Women's Institute and the Mothers' Union, which terrified the bishops, and they were terrific. And we won, and with huge help from the solicitor friend, Maggie Ray, it became law. It was the cross-party women's network, in this case, that won it. And as a result, in a divorce settlement now, very often he'll take pension, she'll take the house, but at least it's part of matrimonial property and access to such. 1997 came into government. We were establishing, a couple of years down the line, the Pension, the pension Protection Fund. Lord Higgins led for the opposition to He was a good man. Terence himself, chair of a huge pension fund, insisted that some of the government's measures in the bill I was handling uh, were inadequate. I thought he was right and that we were wrong. So I took an amendment away in order to DWP irritation rather than reject it, and we built it into the bill. I later persuaded DWP to accept another of its amendments, but then we were blocked by the Treasury. But that was the power of the opposite, the former opposition, having a better case from experience than the government and the civil servants. Come on, well, stop. From 2005, I was a backbencher. Now, many women lacked a full national insurance record and with one marriage and two ending in divorce. I wanted them to be able to purchase this year as I get a full state pension. Uh, my Labour government said no. So Lady Julian Shepherd organised the Tory benches in aid and won by a huge vote. And James Powell, the Labour DWP minister, bless him, agreed not to overturn it in Commons. Finally, Tory Welfare Reform Bill 2011. Anyone on basic benefit had had their council tax paid automatically. Now, this was going to be excluded from the see and be run by local authorities inventing their own schemes with a 10% cut in funding from DCRG. A couple of hundred different schemes in which benefit claimants might pay nothing, from my authority of knowledge, or 30% from the adjacent authority of their council tax bill out of their benefit. David Freud, I really read, hated it as much as I do. He appealed upwards, but Eric Pickles could not give way because if not these cuts, HMT insisted on others. So we lost. Council debts have soared. So finally, what lessons might we draw, if any? Key to the laws is that government does not have and must not have an overall majority, and that the, uh, that the lordships, especially across ventures, uh, contain real expertise. We have no research, no research um, assistance at all to be able to do your own research or rely on the expertise of other members of the Lords. And they are hugely impressive. So for us, Parliament really matters. And you will win things that stick, otherwise they matter, they affect. If, first, it isn't ideological, like country sharing. It doesn't cost government money, e.g. local authorities regulating minicabs. Uh, but we did lose CTB, council tax benefit, because that would have cost government money. If in the Lords, as, as has already been mentioned, has support around the House, and you've got peers to attend and listen, rather than just come in for the vote and follow the whip. I remember writing 160 letters once on Sex Island, and begging peers to that effect, especially across ventures. They came in, they listened, and we won. And if we're appropriate, it has support from much respected delegated powers in the Scrutiny Committee and CSAC, which looks at Social Security Advisory Committee, which looks at statutory instruments that it has sound evidence to persuade the box, civil servants, as well as hearts and roses to persuade the, head, the, the Tory backbenchers. And then lots of follow-up meetings to persuade the ministers. Allow others to take credit for the outcome, 
And as with tax credits, where we went through the pause, build on serious unrest down the other end, which only materialised as constituency cases came through and was only hitting the Commons by the time it had got to the Lords. And finally, by using paving amendments or whatever, and I was trained by a genius in the Andrew Macintosh, which is to leave the GLC, um, and by using paving amendments or whatever, get your vote on a Tuesday afternoon at 4.30. And sometimes that's the hardest bit of the lot. <laughs> yes, okay, Helen, thank you very much. <laughs> and forgive my remaining sitting down. Um, yes, I think, I think it's a fantastic book. I don't know if you've all bought it. It's incredibly expensive. Because you can get it from the public library. And I've hugely enjoyed reading it. So thank you for that. And I think it's um, I think it's really useful at the moment to remember where we are is not exactly the world in which the book um, was written. Uh, and that makes it even more influential in some ways. Um, we are now in a minority government. Uh, and there's just been a vote in the Commons. So I, I can't resist my training is always to look to see the result just to make sure it went all went as expected. Um, uh, but, but votes are suddenly mattering. You know, it matters. You, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there could be government defeats. Uh, 1974, there was something like 200 and something government defeats. It does happen if you have a minority government, even with some sort of support to keep them going. And, and secondly, as you mentioned, was, is Brexit. You know, we are getting blinded by Brexit, which obviously is dominating everything. Um, and it may sort of blind us to the annual grind of the 15 or 20 big program bills, which is what this book has selected from. So the standard fare in a mixture of a uh, Labour government enjoying a reasonable majority um, under Mr. Blair and Mr. Brown, and then a coalition government enjoying a reasonable majority, but with a extremely flaky left side, if I can put it that way, never knowing if the Liberal Democrats might be detachable in the wilds of the, of the Labour opposition. Um, to, to be personal, I, I've obviously been around this field not as long as Stephen or, or, or Robert probably, but quite a long time, so I don't go back to Henry VIII, but I do go back a bit. And I find myself being really unhappily involved in some of the minor, in a minor way, in some of these controversies and scars in the book. Um, identity cards. <coughs> I'd forgotten all about ID cards. I imagine, oh, yes, I don't think you have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just all the trouble, first of all, of the preparations, the white papers, the green papers, the select committee reports, the debates, finding the bill, the endless ups and downs on the bill, and going forward, and then blow me a year later, the whole thing is wiped out. Uh, and um, the Lords then attempted to reimburse the poor souls who had invested in identity cards, I think 30 quid ago. Uh, and I'm afraid we had to say that was involving quite a lot of money. Uh, and therefore, uh, it wasn't possible if the, uh, the Commons could have accepted the amendment, but if they didn't want to, that was inevitably the reason. Uh, and I know that upset, including some peers who bought these cards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then there's, there's no uh, and then there's also a bill referred to here, which everyone else would have forgotten about, but again, the then, uh, first parliamentary council at the time, I remember, the Savings Accounts and Health in Pregnancy Grant. Yes. Um, where um, it was eventually decided, um, ultimately by me, although the Speaker agrees, it, it is a difficult decision that it was a money bill. Uh, what I didn't realise is that there was a Lord's concession being prepared to help uh, adopted children. And I'm glad to say adopted children are not suffering from that decision, which I still think was the right one, uh, because some other means has been found to pay it. The, point, the reason I make on those two things is the reality in this book is fantastic to me. That most books about Parliament don't seem to look at what actually happens. They seem to come with not a blank sheet of paper, but a pre-ruled sheet of paper into which various theories fit them. Uh, and what Megan Daniel done is, is very, very different. Uh, bringing all their knowledge, they, they've made it real. In a way that Griffith, and again, I don't Rob, you probably knew. Yes. Well, um, 40 years ago, when I joined the public office, almost exactly 40 years ago, he just published this book. And I knew it was wrong then. Um, <laughs> and that's not very arrogant. Reading it, it wasn't, and as a very young clerk, it wasn't in any way con conforming with the reality that every day in public bill committees, that I, that, I, that I was seeing, and I got some young colleagues here, 
and the test of, you know, when you read the academic books, don't believe them. They're just the best that the academics at the time could do. Uh, and bless him, and he's now, I have no doubt on that. I did read, um, we knew it didn't match reality. Um, Look, Parliament is a legislature. I mean, there's no doubt about that. If someone like Philip Norton says it isn't, it doesn't mean it isn't a legislature because he's a legislator himself. I think it means that the, the way that Congress is a legislature because it's comprised of legislators. And my tiny observation is, is that when American uh, elected politicians die, that's to say those in Congress, not governor, they're often described as having been a great legislator. And I've never seen an obituary of a parliamentarian, actually from either house, that said they were a great legislator. I think, and you're a legislator, I think many peers are legislators. That is to say, that is what rocks their boat, that's where they get their influence, that's what they mind about. I don't think it's fair to say most members of parliament come here in order to legislate. Again, that's obvious, they come here above all to support their party, whether in power or in opposition and to try to win the next election so that their cabinet can replace the existing cabinet. I mean, that's sort of primary school political science. There's no more than they come here so they can become select committee interrogators. We ask them to do these things. They discover, they discover suddenly they've joined a legislature uh, and not a large debating shop uh, or even a scrutiny area or even a, the clash of parties. And a few of them then do enjoy it and become serious legislators. Andrew Dismore is an example of So there are Commons members who, who've grasped it and seen that there is something for them. But generally, of course, they're here to support their parties. Now, Chapter 8, uh, which I recommend to you, is about select committees, which was open my eyes. Select committees, we say in the books, are not engaged in legislation. Well, I, I, again, having served on quite a lot of them and, and been the clerk of committee, I knew that was untrue. But this has finally blown that, that theory out of the water. Most of the bills seem to have, almost most, I think, some select committee influence, and some of them quite substantial select committee influence, even if it takes time. Uh, for example, on, on the health bill, they got smoking right. The government's original proposition on banning smoking, which again, I'd forgotten, probably some people here remember, was bizarre, which is that you'd be allowed to smoke in a pub as long as it didn't serve food which was based on some sort of elderly public health concern that the, the tobacco ash might get in your banner and mash. Whereas obviously the concern is passive smoking and whether you're eating or just breathing or reading the newspaper. And it took the House of Commons to change that. And that makes a huge difference to all our lives. I mean, probably none of you are old enough to go to pubs, but um, <laughs> most of you are still looking forward to that. You will be in a smoke-free atmosphere, so enjoy it. The House so, of Commons changed even though it was in the government's manifesto. Yes, which is an astonishing manifesto mistake. So <laughs> this is, which may undermine some of the other strengths, some of the other, uh, what are they called, faces um, that you have. So um, I, love, I love the six faces. The, um, the insight that, is, uh, that you've referred to in your introduction is that people in the system don't realize how it works. Uh, <laughs> That's actually quite British, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it is quite surprising that, and there's a quote you didn't give, but the backbenchers saying at the end of something and talking to a minister after some bill had gone through, and they said, wow, that was a hard push, or worse that effect, because you really had us on the ropes. And he said, I didn't realize we were taking all this seriously. <laughs> you know, every amendment that gets put down, some poor civil servant writes notes on the amendment, the line to take, the reserve line to take, what should we do if? So they're taken at least that seriously. You never know, something might happen. Civil servants are frightened of, of Parliament, both houses, and therefore they are having influence when they don't know it. Um, and uh, civil servants will be honest and say, yes, we're worried about it. So please, you know, we must tell legislators you are influential, don't fool about, this actually has an effect. The bibliography, again, those of you who are students, and I think some of you may even be students at UCL, is that right? Um, don't admit it, but I think <laughs> the bibliography is fantastic. I'm about the only person not in it, and I can see people in this room, certainly, who are all over it. Um, it even has, if I may be mischievous, a reference to Mark Oaken, a oh, slightly yes. forgotten Liberal Democrat, it would be no offence, I hope, whose autobiography is called Screwing Up. Uh, and I thought, this is a really great work of academics that you we found out something that Mark Oden thought. He was a terrific interviewer. <laughs> yeah, terrific <laughs> So your two faces, um, I, I just, I was struck by two when I, when I read the book. 
One is what you call anticipated reactions. And that is the most difficult, isn't it? I mean, because you can't prove it. I gather there's an academic uh, called, is he called Mezze? Like the Greek restaurant thing? Mezze? Mezze. 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 Anyway, he, I gather he sort of invented this. And it's a perfectly obvious fact that, that you don't put in front of Parliament a bill that's going to get defeated. And therefore, you anticipate the reactions. Uh, and one of Stephen's um, uh, predecessors, uh, George Engel, is in the, I'm going to read this article, is in the bibliography, uh, an article he wrote called Bills are made to pass as razors are made to sell. Now, I don't know where that phrase comes from. I didn't know razors were made to sell. <laughs> well, no, it's a lovely phrase, but it's a very good phrase. That is what bills are written for, is to pass. So it, it's not drafts primarily, or, those two, or others, but the government as a whole will say, of course we're not going to put this in because it's going to get defeated. So, so why bother, unless it's in the manifesto, I mean, we feel we have to. If, they were, if government was governing by decree, as I believe they do in France, I may be wrong. Uh, if government was governing by decree, things would be different in so many ways that this book shows, in actual things that matter to people. Um, the second thing was agenda setting, and that remains to me because I'm not, I'm, like, I'm not a politician. Why things suddenly emerge? And I don't think other people always know. I think they just think, we've been talking about this for years. Why is it suddenly bubbled up to the top? And that is a legislative power. Um, Same-sex marriage came out of nowhere in about nine months. There had been no debates about it. I think I'm right in either house. It's a classic case. People knew about it in other countries and so on. Suddenly it emerged. Um, modern slavery, uh, female genital um, manipulation, which personally I did have an action campaign against in the 1980s. That's a personal. And we had absolutely no effect at all. Like we couldn't even find a, forgive me, we couldn't even find a peer who was interested. Uh, and suddenly, I seem to be sitting there about five, six years ago, and the, everyone was talking about it in the EDMs, and, and somewhere, suddenly, a, a switch went over, and you're giving me the time over. Um, so the, um, the process matters, but what is great about this book is it hasn't got lined up with the process the way everything else has. I think it's about what has actually happened. The one missing thing, which is my final observation, because there's got to be a little criticism, is opposition backbenchers. I think there's a tendency to regard the opposition as a solid block. Yes, not, not a mistake we'd be making now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we never should. Well, maybe we never should. Yes. You, know, you talk about government backbenchers, obviously rebellious against the government. I'd love to see more study of rebellious opposition backbenchers mm -hmm. because they are also hugely influential. The first big vote on the Brexit bill yesterday was from Frank Field. Uh, very much against the government. We have Chris Leslie, who is putting down lots of amendments to the Brexit bill. So both the anti-Europe and the pro-Europe factions in the Labour Party are also hugely influential in these Brexit debates. And those are not the only examples. But just say, Dennis, this all matters. You know, people who are 16 and 17 can't buy cigarettes because of changes made here. As you say, housing benefit recipients who were on job seekers allowance, people who want to wander in forestry commission forests, People like me as a corporate officer, I'm now liable to corporate manslaughter charges. So the, the pills that you're looking here, they actually change things. So it is a great eye opener. Thank you very much for it.